Hello, and welcome back to the 2020 Ferguson Library Virtual Make Fest. Next up at 1.15, we have Kate Kostersky with Everything Isn't Awesome Right Now, But Knitting Is. By day, Kate Kostersky sells physics to unsuspecting librarians in Europe. By night, she turns the physics of knitting on its head, throwing down mad stitches while watching everything from Doctor Who to Star Wars to random 80s commercials on YouTube. A knitter since 2008, when she wanted to use her first summer off from grad school learning something, Kate is also on the board of the Big Apple Knitters Guild, running its website and social media. You can find her as well some Friday nights at the Knit in the Pit virtual meetups. In addition, Kate is also an Eisner, winning award, Eisner Award winning comic journalist with contributions at Women Write About Comics, Panels IX, or Panel X Panel Magazine, and Multiversity Comics, where she also runs social media. So with that, I am going to give it to Kate and she yeah. can... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, Frank, for that great introduction. And hello to everybody at the Ferguson Library. Uh, thanks so much for letting me join you today to talk MakeFest. Uh, I have been, as Frank said, a knitter since 2008 when I was in grad school, uh, finished my first year of grad school, and I was looking for something to occupy this three months that I had off between my first academic year and my second academic year, which you think... I just want to sit around and watch TV all summer. Now my brain was in this place where it's like, I need to learn something. So I thought of two things. I'm either going to learn to knit or I'm going to learn the stock market. And the stock market one kind of came out of necessity because my dad had some investments. He wanted me to help keep track of them. At this point, 12 years later, you can guess which one kind of stuck, although I did learn enough to help my dad with his investments. So at that said, I have been knitting since 2008. And my goal today is to give you something that can help you with dealing with the stresses of our current time, a distraction tool of sorts. Bring up my, get into sharing my screen and we'll talk a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today. Share. All right, if I could just get a thumbs up that everybody's seeing my screen, that would be great. I got a thumbs up, Oop. and it also helps if I start the presentation at the beginning, doesn't it? <laughs> Let's try this again. So yes, we know everything isn't awesome right now in this world, but knitting is, and knitting can help make it a little bit better. Ah. So when you watch this, what will you learn today? You're going to learn why, I should, why you should start knitting. You're going to learn where you can learn to knit. And we'll have a little demo a little later on in this presentation. But if you want to reinforce the skills that you see in that demo and take your craft further, we give you tools where you can do that. Um, where to buy stuff, knitting needles, where to buy yarn, where to make knitting friends. Yes, you can still make knitting friends even though we're socially distancing. And then as I said, we'll close it out with a quick little demo just to give you the basics to get started with knitting. So why knit besides you can make pretty things? Uh, there's a lot of health benefits to knitting. Uh, the meditative aspect of stitching over and over and over again, sometimes the same stitch, sometimes with different stitches, can really do wonders to calm stress and anxiety. I know personally, when I put down my phone and I stop doom scrolling CNN or Facebook and I pick up my knitting, even for an hour, I just feel a little bit better. When you calm down that stress and that anxiety, it also lowers your blood pressure. So there is a physical health benefit as well because your body isn't in this f constant fear mode, where, mode that is putting stress on your heart. Uh, many who have chronic pain have said that knitting has helped them reduce chronic pain for that same reason, that is changing the receptors in your brain from fear to a more relaxed state. So fear inducing pain, take away the fear, Get, you, you reduce the pain. Because knitting also does work your brain in several different ways, it also helps slow that onset of dementia and Alzheimer's that we can see in older people. Uh, we always talk about we do our Sudoku or our crossword puzzles sometimes on the train or on a Sunday morning over some coffee to wake up our brains. Knitting can do the same thing. And then finally, knitting can actually reduce loneliness. Uh, yes, even in these times where we're supposed to be physically, socially distant from each other, you can find community in knitting and do good with your knitting, knitting sometimes for charity. 
So a lot of times when we think of a knitter, we think of this picture on the right-hand side, an older woman, maybe your grandma, your great aunt, holding these big needles, chunky yarn. She's going to make you something that you're going to smile and say thank you when it's gifted to you and you're going to put it in a drawer and you're never going to wear it again. But knitting is not your grandma's craft. And these are actually pictures of some celebrities who are knitters. Uh, Julia Roberts, Catherine, the Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Ryan Gosling, my personal favorite. He actually took up knitting on the set of his 2007 film, Lars and the Real Girl, because he was wearing, he had to learn it for a scene. Uh, Ringo Starr of the Beatles, Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh, Kristen Ritter from Jessica Jones, who actually worked with uh, Vogue Knitting, which is a popular pu knitting publication company to develop knitting patterns and was featured on the cover of one of their magazines. And Vanna White, who in between turning letters on Wheel of Fortune, knits and crochets and has her own line of yarn from the yarn company Lion Brand. So knitting is not your grandma's craft anymore. There's a ton of people, young and old, men, women, and non-binary who knit for a lot of the reasons I mentioned earlier. So where do you learn to knit? And as I said, we'll have a little demo a little later on to show you some of the basics, but there are other places you can go to learn to knit. The first is, of course, the internet, the, the, the great teacher. Uh, the place I learned to knit 12 years ago is a site called knittinghelp.com, which teaches you all the basics. It's a free site. They have videos that are very clear, easy to see, and easy to follow along. You can also just search on YouTube for, uh, play, for how to knit. Uh, I do this sometimes if I need a refresher on a technique. Uh, I'll search how to do a certain type of cast on, and we'll explain what that is a little bit later. Uh, how to make a certain kind of stitch. Uh, I do have a collection of videos from Webs, which is a popular yarn store in Massachusetts that are all about knitting technique. There's some of my favorites also to refer to. Uh, the online, uh, there is also an online service called Craftsy, formerly called Blueprint, that has all kinds of craft classes in knitting, crochet, spinning, weaving, and any other craft you can think of. Uh, they have, they were, as I mentioned, formerly called Blueprint. Uh, the Craftsy name has come back, and they are in the process of relaunching the site. And with the site's relaunch, you'll be able to purchase and view classes on video. You'll have a ways to interact with instructors in the classes and supplies and pro that you can purchase from the site. If you don't want, if you're not a big internet person, you can also take, find classes uh, in person hope, with social distancing these days at yarn and craft shops, uh, se several chain craft shop shops such as Michael's, Joanne Fabrics offer classes. A lot of those though have moved to Zoom, uh, but there's also independent yarn shops that sell knitting and crochet supplies that also host their own classes. There's also knitting events that feature beginner circles and places where you can learn to knit. It just happens this weekend that Vogue Knitting, which is one of the more popular publishers of knitting and crochet books, is hosting one of their virtual events, Virtual Vogue Knitting Live. Um, their Learn to Knit sessions were held earlier in the week. Otherwise, I would tell you, go to their website, pay $4 for a ticket, and go learn to knit there. But uh, they will be hosting these events throughout the rest of this year once a month. And finally, you have books where you can learn to knit. And I've had some pictures of some books below that are all available at the Ferguson Library. So you can go right to the library and learn how to knit. Where to buy knitting supplies? So for knitting, you're going to need generally two supplies. You're gonna need yarn and you're gonna need knitting needles. So where can you buy all this stuff? The first place I would recommend, especially as if you're a beginner, is to check out some chain craft shops such as Michael's, which I believe still has a location in Stamford, and Joanne Fabrics, which does have locations throughout Fairfield County in Southwest Connecticut. You can buy your yarn and your knitting needles pretty relatively inexpensively there. 
um, you don't want to spend too much money to start because you're not sure how much you're going to end up liking this and you don't want to spend two hundred dollars on yarn and on knitting needles only to find out that this wasn't for you as you become uh, as you get into knitting and you realize hey i like this maybe i want to continue with this you can start checking out what's called the lys which is the local yarn shop and these are shops solely devoted to the yarn crafts. They will sell yarn, they will sell needles, they will sell books, magazines, and other supplies and notions that you may need. And I've listed a few in the area, in the area here. Uh, if you're not comfortable or shopping in person, always have online shops as well. I mentioned Webb's America's Yarn Store, which is right up uh, right over the border of us in Springfield, Massachusetts, but some other places are Jimmy Beans, Knit Picks, and Lion Brand. And one of the great things is all of these online shops are also extremely affordable. So if you want to, if you don't find what you need at a chain craft shop, you can always order from them without breaking the bank. So you have your yarn, you have your supplies, you're kind of getting into it, you're thinking, hey, I'd like to meet some other knitters. Let's, where can I make some knitting friends? There's a couple places you can go. Uh, the biggest with the largest worldwide reach is Ravelry. It's a social networking site for knitters. Uh, it, I, I often call it like the Facebook of knitters, but it's a little more than that. Uh, in addition to having a place where you can connect with other knitters, it allows you to do things like keep track of the yarn that you buy, the projects that you make, the needles that you have. But importantly, it has message boards and forums where you can connect with knitters that live in the same geographic area as you or even around the other side of the world, if you're interested. Uh, who have a similar other interest, whether it be a TV show or uh, another sort of hobby, Par if you're a, you know, parents that are knitters, knitters that like Doctor Who, knitters that uh, are big fans of Formula One racing. And you can also connect with knitters that have you can also connect with shops there. Many shops do have a presence on Ravelry where they do have shop members available to answer questions or post information about sales. Uh, and folks who are connecting over the fiber festivals that we do have, uh, most of which are now online, but they will be someday back in person. Another great place to meet knitters is through knitting guilds, which are smaller groups, uh, generally geographically based, for people to meet up and discuss and learn more about their craft. Uh, I did a quick check of knitting guilds in Connecticut and while I did find a couple of groups listed, I can't really easily verify if they're active, but you can also check out the Big Apple Knitters Guild, which is our neighbors the next door over in New York City. Full disclosure, I'm on the Big Apple Knitters Guild board. I run their website. And we do have meetings every month. We do welcome knitters of all skill levels. Our meetings are for the rest of 2020 done on Zoom. And if you're interested, my contact information is at the end of the slides, and, or you can reach out to Frank at the library and he can put you in, in touch with me and I can give you some of that information. There's also online knitting events. I talked about the virtual knitting live from Vogue Knitting, which is a great place to connect with other knitters and build up your skills and make friends. And inevitably, as you dive into some of these groups, Ravelry, for example, online knitting events, you may find other ad hoc knitting groups that pop up. Uh, in my intro, Frank mentioned that I was a member of a group called Knit in the Pit, uh, which is just a group that started in my home state of New Jersey that would meet up in Asbury Park at the hotel. When the pandemic happened, the uh, founder took it all online and we ended up with a group of over 400 people on our Facebook page from all around the world, all across the US. Uh, the group is currently on hold at this point. Um, our, sadly, our founder passed away unexpectedly a few weeks ago and we're determining what direction Knit in the Pit is going to take next. But the point is that you, can f you will find, not in an organic way, uh, other people to knit with. You'll, you'll make knitting friends. Uh, we have many people in our guild who are have started up their own little online knitting groups just getting together as uh, to build that community that we've been missing from having our in-person meetings. And now it's time for you to actually see how this works.
So I'm going to switch over to my other camera and we're going to do a little knitting demo. Okay, oop. Let's just go. So we are going to switch over here to my second camera and I've got a few things I'm going to show you. So just give me a second to get adjusted so I can hopefully show you better. So, so we're going to start, we're going to show you some of the basics of the tools that you use when you're knitting, uh, the knit stitch, the purl stitch, casting on, which is how you get stitches first on your needle, needles and binding off, which is how you get stitches off your needles. So what I have here is I'm going to show you just some basic knitting needles. Um, as you can see, these are what are called straight needles. They're pretty long, just to give you an idea. Um, they have a point. Uh, this is not a sharp point. If you're, we're doing this with your kids, if they touch this point, they're not going to prick themselves. Uh, these, of course, sharp, straight needles are not the only kinds of needles that are available. We also have things like, let me turn off my light, maybe you can see this a little clearer, uh, what are called circular needles. So a circular needle is a needle that is two needle tips, they have the two purple tips right here, connected by a cable. And the benefit of the cable is this allows you to knit things in the round. So you can knit things like hats, sleeves of sweaters and socks. And when you have a longer cable like this, I'll just show you, give you an idea. If you're knitting something that has a lot of stitches like a blanket or a big shawl, it's easier stress on your hands and on the needle when you have the stitches resting on a cable instead of on the needle itself. And another kind of needle that you see is what's called a double pointed needle. Again, you can see the points here. They're not sharp. They're very dull. So again, if you're doing this with kids, they're not going to hurt themselves. <laughs> and the benefit of these needles, as you can see, they're pretty small compared to this one right here. I think I can show you just the perspective. Uh, they're great for knitting small objects. So knitting, knitting socks, knitting the top of a hat, knitting a small sleeve for say a baby or a child sweater. The one thing I do wanna point out is all of these that I've shown you now are plastic, but needles do come in other types of materials. Bamboo is very popular, metal is very popular, stainless steel is very popular. Uh, I, you will find over time as you knit, you'll have things that you'll have different materials that you like. I personally like bamboo because the stitches don't slide as much on the needle. On a plastic needle, on a stainless steel or metal needle, they do slide a little bit. And if you're working with something that's very fine and very delicate and you're not careful, the stitches can pop off the end of the needle here. Yarns come in all kinds of thicknesses, fabrics, and textures. The one I'll be using for my demo here is a very bulky yarn and I got you a nice little close up here you can see it's kind of fuzzy it's got it's very it's like thick it's heavy it's what you'd feel like if you were wearing a big bulky sweater in a couple of months but yarns also come in very thin textures so this is a yarn that is very very fine you can see here You have a yarn as well. This one is a little, little thicker. It's not as thick as the blue one that we looked at, but it's a little, it's not as thin as that light blue one that we have either. And then this one here, again, a little thinner, little, not as, th uh, not as thin as some, but not as thick as the others. This yarn is also fun. It's got little sparkles in it. And yarns can come in, and the way yarns are, weighted, how they determine this thickness is through what's a technique called wraps per inch. And what they do, what you do is you would take a ruler. I don't have one handy, otherwise I'd show you how to do this. And you wrap the yarn around the ruler like this, like I'm doing with my finger until you get to, wrap a little more here, until you get to one inch and you put each wrap 
side by side. And then you count the number of wraps across to one inch. So if a yarn has maybe six wraps per inch, it's considered a bulky yarn. If a yarn has 12 wraps per inch, it's considered a, maybe a finer yarn. As you can see, the more wraps per inch you have, the, the finer the yarn is. And yarns come in different, uh, different uh, types of fibers as well. We often hear yarn, we often think of as wool. So we think this looks like a bit of a bulky wool right here, this blue one. Uh, but yarns can also come in cotton. I'll show you this is an example of a very, very thin cotton yarn here. And yarns can come as blends. Uh, this fun sparkly yarn I showed off earlier is a blend of merino wool, which is a type of sheep and nylon because it was designed for socks and you, when you are designing something with when you are knitting socks you kind of want them to stay on your feet and then the sparkle is a fabric uh, type of fiber called stellina which just makes it fun uh, so there are all kinds of yarns out there one of my favorite yarns i was working with recently is actually part bamboo and part uh, yarn polyester made from recycled bottles so if you are allergic to wool in any way Never fear, there's plenty of fibers out there for you. So we're actually gonna do a little bit of knitting now. I'm just gonna unravel my yarn here a bit. Move up so you can see a little better. The type of knitting I'm going to show you today is called English knitting. And it's where the yarn that we are working with is held in your right hand. So right now I'm holding out my right hand. There are other ways you can learn to knit. There is continental knitting, which is where the yarn is held in your left hand. Uh, I learned the English way, but know that there's other ways that you can learn and you can, that's where I give you the resources to go on the internet, look at books from the Ferguson Library and find what works best for you. So we're gonna use our yellow needles and we'll use this blue yarn. The first step is you've gotta get this onto this. How do you do it? This is a process called casting on and there's a myriad of ways that you can learn to cast on stitches onto your needle. Uh, they can vary by the type of project that you're making. Uh, if you're doing something with a stretchy uh, edge you want to cast on that stretches a little bit so that when that it can go over your head or go on your over your flag. Uh, the one I'm gonna show you is a very simple one called a backwards loop cast on, and it's a great one to learn to start knitting. So the first thing I do is I'm gonna make a slip knot. So I make a little loop here, and I'm gonna pull the, what is we going to call this the working yarn, which is the yarn that comes from your ball, the yarn that's sort of hanging out right here, you can see the end, that's the tail. So we're gonna take the working yarn, pull that through this loop I made, and we've made a slip knot, so we're gonna put it on my needle. And when I put it on my needle, I want the tail. Remember that's the tail is the end that is just sort of hanging out there in space in the back. So if I'm holding this and I'm looking at it, the tail is on the right, my right, and the working yarn is on the left. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a loop with my finger like this loop. I'm going to turn it around and place it on the needle. So I'm going to make a loop, flip my hand around, place that flipped around loop on the needle. It's called the backwards loop cast on. I'm going to do a couple of these for you. So I'm going to make a loop, twist it around, turn it around, put it on the needle and pull my working yarn so that it's not too tight but not too loose. You want it to rest snugly on the needle. Make my loop, turn it around, place it on the needle. Let's do this a few more times. Make my loop, turn it around, place it on the needle. And you'll do this for the number of stitches that you need for the pro, which will be specified in your knitting pattern. In this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, we'll do a few more. Loop, place on the needle. And you can move the stitches down your needle as you go along. 
loop, turn it around, place it on the needle. Take the loop, turn it around, place it on the needle. Take the loop, turn it around, place it on the needle. So now we're at this point, our part, we've cast on stitches, looks like this. I've now turned this needle around so that the tail, the, hang, the part that's hanging out in space is on the left hand side of the stitches that we just cast on and the working yarn is on the right hand side. I'm gonna hold this needle now in my left hand. That's this hand. It's gonna be my hand with my Apple Watch. I'm gonna hold the other needle in my right hand. And this is where the actual knitting happens. So I'm gonna take the right hand, the needle in my right hand, this one, and I'm gonna stick it in the loop like this so that the right hand needle is behind the left hand needle. Then once I do that, and this is going from front to back of the loop. So you can also do it the behind the loop, but which is called knitting through the back loop. But we're doing to do a basic knit stitch, you're doing it in the front loop. I'm gonna take my working yarn and I'm gonna wrap it around that right that needle that was in my right hand. It should it should still be in my right hand. It's kind of floating in space right now, so I can show you this from left to right. So it's going to go up, around, over the needle, and back, left to right. Now, the next step is pulling the needle and that loop you just made around it out. So you can do it very slowly, and you use the tip of the needle to catch the loop, but you're not pulling it off. You're not pulling anything off yet. So now you've still got the first stitch you cast on on the left-hand needle, and the stitch that the loop that you just made on the right hand needle. Now that you've done that, you can pop off what was on the left hand needle and pull it tight. Again, not when I say tight, I don't mean tight like you're tying your shoes really tight, but tight enough so that it sits snugly on the needle. And there's a little rhyme that you can learn to, uh, you can learn to learn this step. So I do call this in through the front door once around the back, peek through the window, because you're kind of peeking through that, that first stitch on your left-hand needle, and off pops Jack. And you just continue in this way. So we are, and you can see here, I made, made mine a little too tight. In through the front door, once around the back, peek through the window, and off pops Jack in through the front door, once around the back, peek through the window, and off pops Jack. And you just do this all the way to the end of your row. out of my way here. Front door. Once around the back, peek through the window, and off pops Jack. Okay. And now we've gotten last stitch, which is actually the slip knot I made earlier, so that counts as a stitch. In through the front door, once around the back, peek through the window, off pops Jack. So now all the stitches that were on the left hand needle, the one that I was, I was holding on the hand with my Apple Watch, are now on the right hand needle. So now, what do you do when you want to make another row? You turn around and that right hand needle now becomes your left hand needle because now it's your working needle. So you want, and you can just start over again. What you don't want to do 
when you start your next row is pull up on your yarn like this. Don't let it hang loose. Don't pull up. Don't try to tighten that last stitch. It's going to be loose. If you pull up, you end up now with two stitches. We're just going to let it go and you repeat the process. So now the left need the needle that was originally in your left hand now goes in your right hand and the needle that was in the right goes in the left hand and you repeat the process. So in, around, out, and through. In, around, out, and through. In, around, out, and through. Just do this all the way to the end of our row. Just unwind a little more yarn here in our ball. In. Out, around, out, and through. In, 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 around, out, there it is, out, and through. And then we're at the end of the row. So what do we do? This, this needle was in my right hand. Now I switch it to my left hand. So you can see here in my left hand, there's my watch. And again, repeat the process. I'm just going to do this a couple more rows here. Take a quick look at the chat. I don't think we have any questions. I'm just going to keep going here. And as you master the knit stitch, you will find you become faster. I mean, there's some people that I, I, I've heard stories, people knit like 50, 60 stitches in a minute, uh, but you do find you pick up speed as you go. But you don't want to also get too fast because you can get a uh, repetitive injury from knitting. Uh, if you go too fast, if you really, if you strain your wrists, if you are a sufferer of carpal tunnel syndrome, I would recommend, there are knitting, there are braces that you can get and I'd recommend one of those as well. So I'm gonna do one more row so you can get an idea of what the fabric I am making looks like. I admit this is actually the first time in at least a decade I am using these straight needles. Uh, so it is a little, I will say it is a little awkward for me because you do find over time you have a preferred needle style that you like to use. Personally, I prefer to use those circular needles that we, uh, that you saw earlier. As you can see, like I said, these are really, really long needles. So it's a little awkward to hold at times. But, there, but, but this kind of needle is a good needle for a beginner to get the basics down because you don't have to worry about uh, stitches falling off so much. Remember the double pointed needles didn't have the little knob on the end like this needle did and the circular needles uh, sometimes stitches can slide off because again you don't have a knob on the end you have a point and a point. Now when I showed you the end of this needle just now, I'll show it again, uh, you probably saw a number on it that says US 8. That is the size of the needle, which corresponds to the diameter of the needle. Uh, in this case, a US 8 is equivalent to five millimeters uh, in the rest of the world. And you can see that needles have different, the thicker the needle, the larger the size. So the needle I was showing, the circular needle, this is a size 13 needle. So you can see it's really thick and it's gonna make nice, big stitches. Uh, these needles are, I believe, a size seven. So they're close to the size of this needle, the diameter, little smaller. Uh, you can have needles that go up to size zero and double zero. Um, I will show you a, okay, a minute, I can show you a smaller needle. Just have it attached to another project here. 
Uh, and it's also an opportunity to show you what a needle in another material is like. So this is a needle here that is a size three. It's a smaller millimeter. I don't know what millimeters that is off the top of my head, but you can see compared to this one right here, put them on top of each other as much as I can. So you can see that one is thicker, thinner than the other. And you can also see that this is a bamboo. Um, it's more, it's a little like a wood, it's a lighter wood, and there are actual wood, tree wood needles out there, but it's, I like this material, it's very smooth, but it's not too smooth. This is very, very slick. So certain kinds of yarns can slide off more easily on this kind of needle than they would this kind of needle. Just get that out of the way here. And we're gonna go, we're gonna do one more row of our little demo that we're doing here. So through the, we did the in through the front door, we did the once around the back. We're gonna peek through the window, off pops Jack. That is a great little rhyme you can use if you're teaching kids how to knit. I'll just go back here. So many things of yarn on my desk right now. I am a little tangled up, so let's get that out of the way. Through the front door, once around the back, jump peek through the window, off pops Jack. So I've done a couple of rows here of just the straight knitting back and forth across, and we have a little bit of a fabric going here. I'm gonna show the camera. Uh, this is what's called garter stitch. It's when you are knitting straight and you are knitting on both sides, that, that both sides of the fabric are knit stitches. So they both, so either way, they look exactly the same. The next, it's kind of bumpy, and it feels bumpy when you're holding it. The next stitch I'm gonna show you is a purl stitch, and this will allow us to make a smoother fabric, which you often see if you're wearing a knit sweater, it's called stockinette stitch. Okay, so we're gonna do a purl stitch, which you're gonna, which is the reverse of a niche stitch, essentially. So to do a purl stitch, you're gonna start the same way you did with the knit stitch. So you're gonna hold the yarn, you're gonna hold the needle with the fabric you've been knitting, in your left hand, so here it is, left hand, and you're gonna hold an empty needle in your right hand. Instead though, remember when we did the knit stitch, you put the yarn in through the back so that it was, the point of the needle was pointing behind the work. We're gonna actually put it in the front. We're gonna let the yarn also hang in the front. You've also probably noticed that I was wrapping it around, got the tangle there, around the back of the needle, so it was always in the back of what we were working on. Now we're going to do it in the front. So we're going to put our needle, our empty needle, through the front of the stitch so that instead it is crossing the needle, the empty needle is on top of the needle with the fabric that we worked with. With the knit stitch, the empty needle was on the bottom. In a purl stitch, the empty needle is on top. The yarn is also going to go around this front as well. So we're going to wrap it around the front, but this time we're gonna go right to left, so right to left, and then the process is the same. You peek through so that you still have the stitch on your left hand needle, the loop on the right hand needle, and then pop it off. So for a purl stitch, the needle's gonna go in the front, wrap it around right to left, peek through the window and off pops Jack. So the only difference between a knit and a purl stitch is where this empty needle, your right hand needle, goes. So if it's a purl stitch, it's gonna go in the front. 
and your yarn is going to wrap around right to left. And then the technique is the same. Put it in, you know, it's going to poke in through the front, right hand needle on top, wrap right to left. That's actually a good way you can remember a purl stitch is going to be right, right. Right needle on top, right to left wrap. Top, left, top, left. I'm just going to make these purl stitches across the row. Now we finish the purl stitch. Switch your needle. So we're going to switch our needles. So needle that has the stitch, the work, the fabric on it goes to the left hand. Empty needle to the right hand. Now to do a stockinette stitch, you alternate the rows of knitting and purling. So we just did a row of purling. So we are going to go back to doing the knitting. So just to remember to review, when you knit, right is on the bottom. Wrap it around. In through the front door, once around the back, and we're wrapping, remember we are wrapping left to right, and you work your way down the row. Now a question I often get asked is, how do I know what needle to use for my project? Well, if you're making something that is going to be a scarf or a shawl or something that isn't going to fit closely to your body, you can, you, you know, the, that's, the needle size may not be totally important. If you're doing something that is fitting closer to your body, like a sock, sock socks or a sweater or a hat, then you want to make sure that you're meeting what's called gauge. And gauge is the fit of the project, essentially. And every pattern will tell you what your gauge should be. Uh, everybody's knitting style is very different. Um, some, I'm a very loose knitter. Some people are very tight knitters. They, they hunch up like I'm like, like this. Um, you might, and when you hunch up and you're a tight knitter, your hat may not fit that person's head because your stitches are very tight. If you're a more relaxed knitter, your stitches are looser and you may, and that hat will just flop around on that person's head. So the knitting pattern will give you a recommended needle size, but if you're doing something fitted, it's always good to test other needles. So for example, if I was making this was, let's say this was gonna be a, uh, a sweater eventually, and it said size eight needles, and it will tell you with your gauge, you want a certain number of stitches in an inch. I measure it and I'm like, too short. It means my knitting is too loose. That means the sweater is not going to fit the way it should. Uh, again, when you're making something basic like a scarf or a shawl that really isn't meant to fit closely to the body, this isn't always an issue. It's still good to check that gauge because you want to make sure you have enough yarn for your project. Okay, so now we did the knitting uh, stitch on the other side. We want to do more stockinette. We're going to do a purl stitch on the other side. So we are going to remember right hand needle in front for a purl stitch, wrap the yarn right to left, and then pop, peek it through and pop it off. Right in the front, wrap it around right to left, peek it off, pop it off. Wrap around, stick it in front, wrap around, peek, pop it off the needle. Stick it in front, wrap around, peek it through, pop off the needle. I'll just do this down the row. Okay, just pull through some more yarn here. So now I'm going to do 
I'm gonna, I think we've got enough here that you can get an idea of the difference in the fabric. So I'm gonna show you the fabric that we just made. Remember we were alternating the rows between knit and purl on the top here and then on the bottom, it was that garter stitch where it was all knit. So you can kind of see the difference now. You can see that the rows that we did where we were alternating knit and purl are very smooth uh, as opposed to being very bumpy. Do one more set of knit and purl that we can do. Just do it. So you can get an idea, really force the skill. Knit. Flip it around. And we go back to purl. Just purl this straight across. Needle in front, wrap right to left, peek through, pop it out. Needle in front, wrap through right to left, peek through, pop it off. Needle in front, wrap right to left, peek through, pop it off. And we just work our way to the end of the row. Okay, so now, actually with this, you can see a little clearer Just down here what that looks like. You can see you've got the bumpy part down here, and the stockinette part up here. Uh, one thing to know about a stockinette, uh, stockinette stitch is that it does tend to curl. So when you are doing something sometimes that is straight stockinette stitch, the smoother uh, fabric here. You may want to put a border on the bottom, a border on the sides so that it doesn't curl because it'll you'll get it off the needle and the fabric will curl in on itself. It's just the nature of the fabric. All right, now you've done your knitting and you want to get it off the needles. That's a process called binding off. And just as I mentioned with casting on, there's a myriad of ways that you can bind off depending on well, what the project is and what the finished edge should look like. It could be an edge that is, that curves into a top, like the top of a hat or the toe of a sock. It could just be a straight edge, like the edge of a sweater. Does it need to be a stretchy edge? Does it need to be a relatively firm edge? It all depends on the kind of project. And if there is a specific technique that the pattern wants you to use, it will mention that. But here's a basic one to get started. So what we're going to do is we start with a knit stitch. So we are going to do in through the front door, once around the back, peek through the window, off pops Jack. And we're gonna do that again. In through the front door, once around the back, peek through the window, off pops Jack. Now what we're going to do is we're gonna reduce our stitch count one by one. And we do this by taking the first stitch, stitch on this right hand side here, that we knitted and we're gonna pass it over the stitch in the front, just like that. And we do that one by one. So you'll knit a stitch and then you'll take the stitch that is on the right, that is the second one here, not the one closest to the point of the needle, pass it over the one that's closest to the point of the needle and pop it off so you're left with one stitch on that right hand needle. So, so the yarn here, we'll knit a stitch, and then we are, it's called a pass a stitch over. So just gonna pass the stitch over and off it goes. Just keep doing this. Pass the stitch over. Knit. Pass the stitch over. Knit. Pass the stitch over. Oops. 
Remember I was saying earlier about how uh, plastic needles, you can, your stitches can pop off sometimes? That's how. <laughs> Knit it. Pass that previous stitch over. I'm gonna knit the next stitch. Pass the stitch over. Knit the next stitch. Pass the stitch over. Ah, there it goes. Ah! stitch. Take the stitch you just had previous, pass it over. Knit it. Pass it over. Knit it. Over. Knit it. Pass over. Pass it over. And now when you've done that, your, your fabrics, there we've gone from 12 or 13 stitches on your knee on the right hand needle now to just one. Now you have that one stitch. I like to tug on it a little bit, make it loose, pop it off my needle, get my scissors, wherever they went. And I cut my working yarn. Remember the yarn, not the yarn that's hanging out here. This is your working yarn. I cut this at a reasonable length, let's say about here. Cut this off. And what I'll do is I'll take that end and I pull it through that last loop, just like this. Pull it tight. And there you have a knitted piece of fabric. You can see the kind of edge that the cast off, that the bind off made, very similar to the cast on. And what you would do with these ends is you'd often weave them into the, uh, rever the uh, reverse side of the fabric that you're showing, the, what's often called the wrong side. So you can take a large tapestry needle, sew it through on the ends, and there you have a piece of fabric. And that's our knitting demo. And once you know the knit and the purl stitch, you can do just about anything. I'm gonna actually switch back over to my presentation. You can do things such as increasing stitches by, and you can decrease stitches by knitting stitches together. So you can make all kinds of fun little shapes with your knitting. So uh, anybody have any questions? Yes, yes, I have a couple of questions for you. So for the first, um, um, how long for different, how long do you need to do like different projects? projects? So you're, you're you're using, using about 12 years. Um, so how long does it take uh, and how has that time changed over um, your knitting experience? That depends on what you're making. Uh, as you learn more skills, projects that, um, it, it, first of all, it's, it's depending on how much time you have. Um, I have found myself knitting more because I've been home and I'm not commuting to New York City one hour away each day. <laughs> so it's easy for me to just go pick up my knitting. Uh, over time, I've found that I can whip out the smaller projects I can get done pretty quick. Uh, when I was on vacation earlier this uh, summer, I ended up challenging myself to knit a pair of mittens in a week, which I did. But larger projects, especially the more stitches you get, some of the thinner yarn, if there's special technique, those tend to take longer. Okay, and one more question. Um, what would you say is a good project for a first time knitter to start working on? Okay, scarves are great because it's really just that back and forth that we were doing during the demo where you get the square piece of fabric that looks like this, uh, or even a bookmark. Um, some people like to start off with hats as a good first project because then you learn how to use the circular needles that we were showing off earlier and how to knit in the round. Um, I would not make a sweater as a first project. <laughs> if you want to do that, more power to you, but uh, keep it simple when you start your first projects. Scarves, uh, bookmarks, little um, 
hats if you want to get further. Um, I, I knit a lot of scarves first. Uh, then I actually was daring and I tried knitting a pair of socks uh, for my father for the first time. And that taught me about knitting in the round and taught me some of the basics of sock construction. So I would say definitely start with scarves. Uh, some people end up becoming just monogamous scarf knitters. Some people become blanket knitters. Uh, some people become shawl knitters. Some people are become specifically sweater knitters. So there's a little something for everyone. Um, whatever you do to start with, keep it simple and maybe keep it small. I wouldn't, I also would not like ma attempt a massive blanket for your first project because those take a while and you're going to get bored very fast. But a, scar a short scarf, maybe a bookmark, is a good place to start. Thank you very much. Well, else to share? Uh, thank you for having me. If you have any questions, uh, my contact information is right here on the slide with my social media. Uh, you can also reach out to Frank at the library uh, to get in touch, particularly if you're interested in uh, uh, finding out more about Big Apple Knitters Guild. Thank you very thank much. You very Kate. Kate. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank so you. So this is been our session for the Virtual Knit Fest 2020 here at the Bergson Library. Our next session will be starting soon at 2.30, so please hang out and enjoy the music, and we will be seeing Chen Wolf uh, talking about drawing and illustrating web comics.